Okay, so um, good afternoon. Uh, today we will um, start um, our lectures. So we start our lecture by reminding uh, you about um, the lab test one. Lab uh, test one will be on Monday, February 4th. And um, we have two sessions, one in the morning and one is afternoon. It's recommended to attend the sessions that is you registers because at that time the computer will be set up to accept your ECS account. So if you register in this first section, please go to the first session. If you register in the second session, go to the second session. Uh, the lab test one is weight out of 15. That day lectures is included on the lab test one. And at the end, I will give some time at the end of this lectures to discuss what we have on the lab test zero. So you can some tips to avoid the same mistake when you go to the lab test one. Okay, so let us start as usual. We start uh, our lectures by reviewing uh, previous lectures, what the topic we cover in the previous lectures. We visit the overriding object method. We have uh, visited three methods, two string methods, that allow us to print a string uh, about the object state. And we mentioned that the object state is actually the value of the fields. So each class has some set of fields, and the value for these fields is represent the state of the object. So two string allow us to print to the client the state of the objects. And also equals, we say that we create a class, and from this class we initiate a new object, and this object, we need to compare these two objects for equality, not for sorting or ordering, for equality, if you need to say the first object is equal to the second object, given that these two objects, object one and object two, are from the same type. So, for example, we mentioned this. Uh, you have a laptop. You create a class called laptop. Inside this class, you have two attributes. Let's say the CPU and the amount of RAM inside the laptop. So, you say we need to compare two laptops based on equality. If they have the same CPU and if they have the same RAM, we say these two laptops are equal. So you compare for equality of two objects of the same class. If the object is not from belong to the same class, immediately we retain false to the client that these objects are not equal. It's not uh, wise to compare a laptop class to a smartphone class. So these two objects are from two different classes. So immediately we retain false. And also we visited the hash code. We say that it's very good to take the object state, the value of the field, and generate an integer representations for this object. And we say that uh, hash code is a method we inherit the behavior for hash code from the object class and the behavior is using the reference address to generate the integer we say we can override this behavior by overriding a hash code for our objects and we generate a different integers it's very important to override hash code and equals method if you decided to override the equal hash code it's good to override the equals. And we mentioned in the last uh, lectures that Eclipse can do this job for us. We can ask the Eclipse to generate the hash code and equal methods for our object. And then once Eclipse generates this method, we can revise it as is required based on the ABI or the given ABI. Now, this is what we covered last time. Today, we're going to continue, look at the behavior of the object. And we mentioned that Java give us some a certain behavior. And this 
default behavior, we inherit this from the object class. We have compare to method. It's very important. You create uh, objects from the same class, and you need to sort them out. Which one is coming first? Which one, one is coming after? In term of sorting, if you have two objects, this object is greater than the second object. Back to our example, for example, you have a class called laptop, and you have the CPU and the RAM. You need to sort the same laptop based on the RAM. This is 265 gig. This is 128 gig. So which one is coming first based on sorting? You compare the object for sorting. And also the clone method. The clone method is allow us to take the object and make a copy of it. Exact copy of this object. And we're going to come to the concept of sh shallow copy or a deep copy. And if we have an opportunity, we're going to discuss how normally the object or a class that we create on the Java are containing mixed between static and non-static attributes or fields and static and non-static methods. Also, we have a new concept called utility classes. And these utility classes allow us to have all the method inside it or all the behavior inside this class is static. And we cannot create an object from these utility classes. Similar uh, example or the famous example of utility class is math. Math is a utility class. You use it from the lab 0 and lab 1 and might be you able to use it on lab 2, I think. So math is a utility class. You cannot create an object of math inside Java because it has a constructor that is a private. We're not allowing the client to create an object from utility class. And we're going to be able to do and build a utility class in this course. So let us start. So you need to compare object for ordering. Which one is bigger than the other? Which one is less? If they are equal in the same order? So let us see. So we compare the object. We use less than or greater than. These are not working with objects. That greater than, less than, simple work very good with a primitive type, but not with an object type on Java. For example, if you have a date, you need to sort them, which one is coming before the other date. Normally, greater than or less than called operator overloading, or like on C++ or C sharp. These are methods that you overload them in your code to give them a specific behavior to, to handle the object that you are creating. Uh, a natural ordering a rule that is governing the relative placement of the object, which one before the other. We have equals that compare the objects for equality. Okay, And there is, a, sometimes you have object A, P, and C. You need to make this A is this than or equal to B. B is this than or equal to C. It's good when you create an object in Java to be able to do this, to be able to arrange the object based on some kind of order. So to be uh, able to do this, we have a comparison methods. And if we have uh, object A and object B, we need to m say A is this than B, A is equal to B, or A is greater to B. How we will be able to do this? We need to implement what we call a comparable interface. We cannot. You see in, on the equals and hash code and two string, we're not implementing any kind of interface. We simply override the method in our class. Here, no. To be able to compare a new object, we have to implement a comparable interface for our class. For our class that we create, we have to implement a comparable interface. As you can see here, this is a public interface comparables, and there is a triangle brackets, and there is a capital T, and inside this interface, there is only one method, and this method is public 
routine type is int, that means routine and integer, a primitive type, and the name of the method is compare to, and also the same T capital is appear again as an argument type, and there is others. So this comparable interface, once we implement it for our class, we will be able to compare our objects and sort them, which one is the greater than the other, which one is equal to the other. How we can do this and how we can call this comparable? Uh, assume you have object A and object B. You can call A dot compare to P. And this will retain an integer value less than zero if A comes before P. And now I'm just giving an abstract definition. I didn't specify how we are comparing object A and object B. Whenever an object A is less than object B based on your implementation, the retain type is int, and the retain value should be less than zero. If the object is greater than, we retain a positive value. If the object is equal, we retain zero. So the behavior of compare to, given two objects, A and B, that A and B have the same type the same, from the same class, you are comparing them. Uh, the compare to will retain a positive value if A is greater than P, or come before, we retain, sorry, greater than zero if it's coming after, and less than zero if coming before, that means less than P, and if the A is equal to P, we retain exactly zero. And this class, uh, this method throw a class cast exception if you are trying to compare two types from different class. You try to compare a laptop to a smartphone, you will have an exception raised. You can compare two laptops, two smartphones, the same type. You cannot compare two objects from different classes. Once you are doing this, you will have a retain type exception, class, cast, exceptions raised in this method. For example here, we have two string, A and P. The value for the string we are using a dot compare to b, and this will retain less than zero, and this is true because a is less, p is greater than a. There is some implementation for the string, how the string is comparing to value. a is less than p, and this will be true. And here is showing you how you are using greater than, less than, or equal, not equal, with compare to. And we mentioned that for a primitive type, you can use greater than, less than notations, but for object, you have to use a dot compare to p less than zero if you want to test that if a is less than p. And if you want to test that if a is greater than p, you have to use a dot compared to greater than or equal to B or greater than P. So once we are work with Java and we create our own object, we are not using greater than or equal simple operator. We are using compare to. And we rely on the implementation of the compare to methods. This is how the thing is in Java. We have a class, public class, and in the red, we have in the name of the class, whatever the name of your class. Implement, we mentioned that this class on a specific, gonna implement some kind of interface, implement comparable interface, and between the triangle bracket, we give the name, the same name of the class. You see here, the name of the class and the same name of the class is, again, we give it to the interface. And inside the body of our class, we provide this method, we give the same signature, public, integer, compare to, and we give the name other. And if you recall from the previous lectures, we use com equals, and the argument type was type of object. No, for compare to, the type of the argument should be e the same as the name of the class, because you are comparing two objects from the same class. So by doing this, this is the syntax, how we can implement the compare to in our class. So we define a class called name, and we implement the comparable interface. For a comparable interface, we provide the name of the class, and also inside the body of the class, 
we provide the implementation for Compare 2. Let us see some uh, actual example about Compare 2. You remember the uh, class point 2. We now we need to compare two points based on some criteria. We can see that. But before we are able to compare our point, we have to follow the syntax. Otherwise, we're going to receive a compiler error. We public a class point two, and we add this to the previous slide, or the previous, sorry, previous class. Implement, comparable, and between the two triangle brackets, we give the name of the class. What's the name of the class? is point two. Now we will start our implementation, some fields, some constructors, some other methods. Now we will start to uh, provide the implementation for compare two. So again, we put annotation for overriding that this method is override the actual behavior. So we override the behavior. We provide the header of the method, public integer compare two, point two inside the argument is point two, not on object, because once you are trying to compare two objects from different class, you will have an exception cast, uh, class casting exceptions, because you are trying to compare two objects from different class. So now we try to provide the implementations for our me method. Now we define this distance and other distance as a double, and we calculate, we give x and y, for the math method to calculate the distance from this point to the origin. So we calculate the distance to the origin, and we decide that based on the distance of, to the origin, we sort out the point. So if the distance to the origin is greater than the other method, then we retain true. If this distance is greater than the other distance, we retain one. That means this object is greater than the other object. If the otherwise, that this distance is less than the other distance, that means this object is less than the other object, we retain negative one, and otherwise we retain zero. Now, the value one minus one, these values should be positive or negative. You can retain five, 10, 100, one million, whatever it is you like as a positive value, positive integers here. But we decide to retain only one, Okay, and also minus one, you decide to retain minus one, but you can retain any negative value, any negative integer, you can retain minus 10, minus 20, whatever is the value you like, you can retain. So, the compared to the only restrictions for the compared to is the sign of the integer. If the sign is positive, that means this object is greater than the other object. If the sign is negative, that means this object is less than the other object based on any criteria you decide to compare these objects. In this slide, we try to compare two points based on the distance from origin to that point. So if the distance is larger than the other, we say this point is greater than the other one. If the distance is less than, so that means that this point is less than. If they have the same distance, then we retain zero. Retain zero is mandatory, you cannot change it, because zero, based on the contract between us and the compare to, zero indicate that this object is equal to the other objects. We can change one, we can change minus one, we cannot change zero. Zero always is fixed to tell the client that this object is equal to the other objects. So this is one way to look how to sort the point in two dimensions. Again, I want to emphasize on this fact, the implementation is not unique. You can have the same criteria, but you can implement it in different way. For example, with the same criteria, calculating the distance to the origin, we can use retain and double. Double A is the wrapping class, is an object, dot compare, and this compare is another interface, but we're not going to cover it today. We're going to cover it later on in the course. Compare is another interface. So we have a comparable interface, comparable as an interface, and we have compare as an interface. So we have two interfaces that allow us to compare the object, but the one that is allow us to use compare to is a comparable interface, and that's what we are focused on in this lecture. 
So we have comparable interface and we have compare two. And you can see here, I'm relying on a double as a class to compare between these two distance. So I'm forwarding my task to other interface or other method on another task class to do the comparison for me. Compare will retain positive if this is greater than, negative if this less than, and zero if this is equal to other distance. Okay? So this another implementation for compare to. Sometimes you need to do different criteria, not only by looking to the distance from this point to the origin. Someone may say, okay, I will look at these two points, I will sort them based on the x value, and if its x value is equal, I will look at the y value. So it's a, a different way. And all this kind of criteria to compare two points should be given to you on the ABI. So you have to read the ABI to know exactly how you are comparing your objects, okay? So once we read the ABI, we find that this time we're not gonna calculate the distance from origin to the point to compare two points, but we have to look at the x axis and see the value for x and see the value for x for the other point and compare between them. So we look at the x. If x less than the other x, we're gonna retain minus one. Otherwise, we're gonna retain one. And else, that means x's are equal. X axis in this point, that's two points are on the same value for x. So we look for the y to break the tie in this case. So if y is less than the other y, we retain minus one. And if y is greater than the other y, we retain one. And if all this is equal, we retain zero. That means a same x, same y for this point. So what is the uh, uh, difference between this version and the previous version is that the way we sort, the way we order the point is different from the current implementation on this slide and the previous slide. And this is depend on the information that is given to you on the ABI. So during the lab test, you have to read the ABI to see how you can sort the objects. And according to the ABI, you have to implement compare two. Any questions based on what we discuss about compare two? Yes, yes, it's, it's um, the point is you rely on the Java expert to build something for you. So you rely on the Java expert to provide you with a set, uh, collections, list, and then you end up by using the collections uh, method like dot sort. You will create an array list, you put a new object inside the array list, then you decide to say, without doing your way of sorting for loop to all the element, you call collection.sort and you give your array list. Now, the collection, it has to look for something to sort your object. The collection.sort will look at the compare two. So if you didn't provide the implementation for compare two, unfortunately, you will be sorting your object in some arbitrary and known way, okay? To make collection.sort work in the appropriate manner, you have to implement compare to. So that's why whenever we create an object inside Java, it's good to revisit hash code equals to string and compare to. But compare to is not coming similar to the same equal, but we have to indicate on the header of the class that public, the name of the class, then we have to specify implement comparable. To let the Java, I need you to implement this interface for me. And once we are implement this interface, it's become mandatory and the compiler will give you an error. We not allow you to run your program without providing the implementation for compare to because you provide that on the header, as you can see here, on the header, I'm telling you point to 
implement the comparable interface, which enforced me to provide an implementation for Compare2. So I cannot compile and run my application without providing an implementation for Compare2. And by providing the implementation for Compare2, I'm telling the Java, whenever you try to use my object inside the collections, inside the rel list, or inside the hash map, or whatever is the collection that I'm using it, if you need to sort my object, please follow this criteria. And in this implementation, on this slide 13, we are comparing X and Y. If X is coming first, that means this, this uh, point is less than the other point. In the previous implementation, we compare based on the distance. Okay? Now, unfortunately, by using comparable interface, we can provide only by one criteria. For example, you, can to, you have to pick up either to compare based on the distance or based on XY. You cannot do two ways of comparing the method. To be able to do that, we have to implement compare interface, which is the one that we saw here. You can see here, double dot compare. So this is an interface allow you to switch between different criteria to sort your objects. By using compare to, actually, you pick up a criteria and you implement it. And you cannot switch after that. Okay? Yes? How you define interface? We're going to come to this concept once we cover the topic of inheritance. Right now, the only thing I want you to do is to implement this interface. We can similarly, what we do in, in the class, public class and we give a name, we say public interface, we give a name for an interface. We're going to define our own interface, we're going to implement our own interface once we come up to the topic of the inheritance. But right now, this is a comparable interface, it's built for us, we're going to just implement it. And once we implement the interface, we have to implement all the methods inside this interface. And comparable interface, there is only one method inside it. It's called compare to. Any other questions? Okay. So remember this. Compare to allow you to implement only one criteria to compare your object. You cannot do like two criteria or th three criteria. Only you have to pick up one criteria and implement it inside compare to. Another trick, you can avoid all these statements and all these code by using just one line. If x is not equal to other x, then we have to see the difference. Otherwise, we're going to see the difference for y. So all the, these uh, if statement, if as a statement, we can reduce them by only one line. It's good to practice on such kind of uh, techniques to be able to reduce the number of line on your code implementations once you come up to the labs or the lab test. As we saw last time, there is a contract for equal, there is a contract for compare two, and whenever we decide to implement a compare two, we have to follow this contract to make sure that our implementation is complete and consistent. So if you are comparing x with y, so if x dot compare y give you a positive value, if you swap them, if you say y dot compare x should give you a negative value. Yes? Do you agree with that? If you are comparing x compared to y give you a negative value, if you swap, which should give you the positive value. And if it's equal to zero, if x compared to y give you zero, also y dot compare x should give you also zero, should not give you any a different number. So this is if you have switched the order between x and y, if x compared to y give you a positive, y dot compare x should give you the negative value. This is one of the condition or a, a constraint inside the contract. Everybody are able to understand this? Okay, agree with this? Now, second condition is a transitive. So if you are comparing x with y and give you a positive value, 
and you are comparing y with z and you receive a positive value, then if you decide to compare x with z, it should give you a positive value. That's what we call a transitive relation. So the compare to hold the transitive relations. And if you have x compared to y give you a negative value, and y compared to z give you a negative value, then if you decide to compare x with z, it should receive a negative value. The similarly, if you have a x compared to y give you a zero and y compared to z give you zero, then x compared to z should give you zero. This is what we call a transitive relation. Okay? Any question? So equals hold the transitive relation, compared to hold the transitive relation. Now, the condition number three is saying that if x compared to y give me zero, then the sign for x compared to z and the y compared to z must be the same. Do you agree? Yeah. So, if you decide to compare x with z and decide to compare y with z should give you the same value because y compared to z, x give you zero. So y compared to z is give you zero. Now x compared to z and y compared to z should give you the same sign, either positive or negative or zero, I don't know, the same sign, okay? Now, there is a strong relation between compare to and equal, and we need to focus to understand the kind of relation, because it will affect our implementation and how we are comparing the objects for equality or comparing the object for sorting or ordering. So, we say that a dot compare P. Now, A represent an object, P represent an object. So, we are saying that A dot compare to P is equal equal zero if and only if A dot equal P is true. So, this is a proposition and is compound proposition. So, there is if and only if. Do you remember if and only if? So, we have the left and right. So we say that a dot compare to, so this is the table for the propositions. You can see here, if a dot compare to p equal equal zero is a true, and a dot equal p is a true, then the value for this proposition is what? True. If the a dot compare to p is true, if the compare to give me true, that means both objects give me zero when I compare them, and equal give me false, what the value for this proposition is false. What I want to say, you can have two objects, and if you look at them based on compared to, you receive zero. You immediately have some kind of uh, decision or some kind of judgment about equal. You say, oh, I compare A, compare to P, and I receive zero, so I implies that A is equal to B. I don't want you to do that. They might be equal, they might be not equal. Okay? So, depend on the implementations. So, you can have both are false, then this is a true. So, if you have A dot compare P is not equal to zero, then you, you can say that, yes, they are not equal to zero. But if this is a true, this can be false. That's what I want you to explain. Look at the second and third line. If the, this is false, this is, can be true. Okay? This is an example. You have a class where there's two fields, apartment number and the street name. So you can compare these two based on the apartment number. Yes? You can say, 
apartment one, two, three, they have in the same building, okay? You can compare based on the apartment number, yes? You say apartment one, apartment two, apartment three, inside the building. But equal, we look only for the street name. If this address is equal to that address based on the street number, yes? Or postal code, yes? You might be say these two addresses are the same. They have the same postal code. But someone need to order the inside the building by looking to the apartment number, yes? Similarly, if you have two laptops, you can say, oh, these two laptops are the same, the same type from Apple, but this has different processor than this one. It has i7, 7 generation. This is i7, 8 generations. So this has come first, and this has come after. So you look on the equal, different way of you looking for compare two. But there's something true, there's something not true. If compare to give you value not equal to zero, immediately you emphasize that, oh, they are not equal. Okay? But you cannot make this a strong tie. That if I have a compare to receive zero, then I will emphasize or I, I'm sure that these two objects are equal. I don't want you to do that. If you compare two objects and you receive zero, it not doesn't mean that these two objects are equal. It might be or might be not. Any question? It's the good answer for your question is to go and try. Uh, equals, we know the actual behavior for equals is looking at the addresses of the object. But compared to, you try the object and see. It's different because it's an arbitrary behavior. I don't know. Okay? The best way to answer your question is really create a class and start using collection.sort. Try to sort them. Okay? And see how the Java will understand the equality. They might be look at the address and sort them based on the address. But as you can see, to provide a, a compare to method and override it, you have to specify on the header of your class that I'm going to implement comparable interface. Okay, which is a little bit different from equal. Equal, you don't need to specify anything on the header. Okay. Now there is a trick about implementing compare to and how we are able to use compare to efficiently. Sometimes, for an obvious things, try to use the float dot compare or double dot compare. Okay, try to avoid creating a, a, a complete from scratch compare to method. Try to move this compared to, to other class that is already implemented. So you rely on some other implementation. Two string. Sometimes whenever you build an object and you using two string, that means you are using a string representation. You rely on two string representation to compare the object between your see here. We retain two string of this object compared to because two string Java expert already built compared to method to compare two string together. Okay? Decided if this string is coming to the before the other string. Uh, the same thing is the delegations for the tricks is, is like sending the problem for other built on uh, method like compare to. Now, if you have a broken implementation for compare to, as I mentioned, tree set, tree maps, these are an example of collections that rely heavily on compare to methods. And if you have a compare to a broken implementation, you will not be able to use this efficiently. And as I mentioned uh, early in this lectures, that utility class like collections and arrays rely on compare to to sort the object and put them in the orders. So you will not be able to use many of these functionality inside the collection and arrays if you have a broken implementations for compare to. Any question? Okay, so we will go to now to another method, which is the last method we're going to discuss, 
is about object cloning, how we can create a copy of our object. We create an object, we spend a lot of time creating this object, we set the value for the field. Now it's time to create a copy from this object, we call it this process cloning. You clone the object. So the clone the object is, is inherited from object class and uh, the purpose of this uh, clone uh, is intended to retain a copy of a calling object. Uh, we have to override a clone in appropriate way for a given class to be able to retain a copy of this object. And the cloning object it means a copying the content of object bit by bit. What do I mean by that? Uh, you have the object, you have the fields, okay, and you have the method. You create a copy of this object, clone the copy of this object. To be able to do this, you have to override clone methods. Look at the header of the clone object uh, for half a minute and tell me what your intuition about it and how we can, uh, what e you are come with any kind of conclusion just by looking to the header of the method. Let me just help you. What is the access modifier for this? Is a public, private, or a protected? It's a protected. It's different from the compared to, from equals, uh, hash code, string, to string. All these methods are public, but this is a protected. Okay? It's a different. Now, what is the retain type? Objects. It's more like general objects. You retain a type, you clone the object, you, you call this dot clone, you retain object. And is this, this method throw an exception called the clone not supported exceptions. Okay? It's already defined on the header of this method. Let us see how we can override this method. So it's a create and retain a copy of this object. Okay? It's a create inside the clone you have to create and you retain a copy of this object now before we discuss how we create a copy we have to come up with a uh, highlighting two definitions uh, a shallow copy is the value for each field uh, of the original object is a copy corresponding to the field of the clone object for the reference fields, we just copy the reference. We just copy the only the reference, not, uh, I mean, object that we are referring to, we're not copying it. We just copy the address for the reference fields. We're going to come to the example to show exactly what we mean by this sentence. Now, for, and this is a dangerous, by the way, here, this is dangerous, we have to focus on. We, whenever we have the fields that are, have a reference type, the object referred to, we're not copying it. We just copy the value for the address. Deep copy is different. Deep copy is copying all the values in the field. Even if we are referring to an object, we copy that object with us. We copy the objects and we retain a new maybe address for the reference fields. Okay? We cannot take a copy of the address because now we copy the object in different address, we retain that address. So let us see. The shallow copy, let's say we have a variable called my car one is pointing to an object of car. So this car is actually on the memory. And you already on your program, you have a variable called my car one. In the shallow copy, we are copying the value of the, of the reference. We're not just the, the, we're not copying the object that this reference is pointing to. So simply the shallow copy will give you a my car two, but my car two has the same memory address and is pointing to the same object. So that is what is the shallow copy. The object is car, is on the memory, and you have my car one is pointing to that car. When we have a shallow copy, we just copy the value of address. We're not copying the object. The object is the same. So we have now two objects, two variables, two reference variables, 
referring to the same object. This is what we call a shallow copy. And this is a dangerous for some applications. Some application is good, but in some application is dangerous, and we're going to come across these applications when we discuss aggregation and compositions. So, everybody understand what the shallow copy is? We're copying the address, we're not copying the object. The object is the same. Any question? Okay. The deep copy give you another copy of the object. So now we have my car one and my car two. The value for the reference of my car one is different from the value for my car two because now we create a copy of the objects. So you have a car object on the memory. You could be the same object on the different address of the memory and you retain that address and you store it on my car two. So you have now two reference variables that each referring to different objects. But these two objects have the same exact copy. Okay? That's what we call a deep copy. Any question? Equal to the default behavior equal to the default behavior comparing, you mean the clone. We're discussing the clone here. But the question you said equal to. Equal to the default behavior compare the addresses. Yeah, it's comparing the addresses. But this is, we're discussing here a shallow copy and deep copy for the clone, which is a different method. Compare, yes, uh, you, Whenever you decide to make equal, implementation for equal, you would like to look at the object state and make sure this object state is the, the same as the other object state. For example, let's say this is a car. You need to see how many doors in this car. So you make sure that these two objects are equal or not. But here we discuss now the clone. Is it creating a copy of the object and retain it back to the client? Either to retain only the reference so the object is not copy actually. We just copying the reference, the address where the object is live in the memory, or we deep copy. We say, oh, we're gonna copy the same object again to the memory. We reserve more memory at that time, and we retain different address where the the new copy is live in the memory now. So the this slide give me a, a hint how the deep copy is working and how the shallow copy is working. Do you have any question? Now, what you are saying, the state of the car is also containing another field that is pointing to another object. That is also need to be copy in the deep copy. You have to copy everything. And that is, we come across the topic of aggregation and compositions. Are you owning the object or not owning the object? If you are owning the object, you should not allow anyone to take it from you. You have to copy it, okay? As everything, you, even if the field is not a primitive field, it's an object field, you have to copy that object inside. So let's say inside this car there is an engine. You have to copy the engine, okay? You have to copy whatever is inside it even. That is a called a composition. We're going to come to that topic later on on this uh, course. Okay? But uh, in, uh, now the only thing is I need you to keep in mind, whenever I say it's shallow copy, I just copy the reference with the object. In the previous slide, you see, I just copy. The object is still the same, live on the same address on the memory. I just copy that address. That's all. Okay? Very simple. In the deep copy, no, I copy everything. Yes. Yes. No, that's that's the, the, but both have the value, the same address. Both. Yes, this is the name of the variable and the name of the variable is pointing to the same address. Okay? My car 1 
let's say that this car is live at address 600. So the value for my car one is equal to 600, and the value for my car two is 600. Where is this car is live in the memory? While here, no, this at 600, my car one, and this maybe at address 700. Okay. Now, to be able to implement the clone, if we just simply ask the, uh, for a default implementation, we're going to have the shallow copy implementation. Okay? So, the default implementation that we are uh, having uh, from the Java is the shallow copy implementation. But sometimes this is not enough. We have to do the deep copy. So that's why we have to revisit the clone and provide our own implementation for this. Now, if the method, the class that you're trying to make a clone does not have a clone method, it will give you an exception, the clone not supported exception. And to be able to override the clone, we have to mention that we need to do that in the header of the class. Similarly, we did with the compare to implement comparable. We now we have to mention implement clonable interface. And inside this interface, there is a clone method, only one method inside this interface. So you can see here, someone decide to create a class A. That's the name of the class. And inside this class, there is a private field in X and there is a method a int a i which is just simply set x okay which is the constructor this is a constructor okay because the name of the method here is the same as the name of the class we call it a constructor we send i we set the value there is a piece of program here a demo the main method so we try to this main method is throwing a class clone not supported exception and we create a new object a object one equal a new a and we give 37 so we create a new object of a class a now we try to make object one dot clone so we try to clone this object as you can see on the body of the class we didn't provide the clone implementation you might come to your mind i'm gonna do the shallow copy implementation. So, any questions about this example? We have a class called A. It only contains one field, X, and this X is a private, and it contains only one constructor. Now, in the demo, we create an object one of type A, and we try to clone it and store it on that object Two. And you look here on the casting, we retain an object and we cast it to A. So we need to make sure that we have A object because the clonable clone method retain object type. Yes? So retain an object which is generic, we cast it. If we do the same, this one, actually we're going to receive a compiler error. There is no object that clone. Nothing here. Object that clone. Yes? So whenever you try to clone the object, you have to provide with an implementation for a clone. If you didn't provide the implementation, the compiler will not allow you to be able to execute this program. There's no uh, execution, the compiler error. And clone uh, method is a protected method. So someone say, okay, very simple, no problem. I will revise the class A. I will provide the implementation for a clone. So you see here, public, object, clone, then try and catch the exception. Retain dot super dot clone is relying on the super class to do the clone for him. Okay? Uh, the concept of super will cover it on the inheritance part, but here is super means the object class, which is the the main class, dot clone. We rely on the object dot clone implementations. And then you can see here, you provide the implementation for the clone, and again, repeat the same program. You think this will work now? Yes? Actually, no. This is still not complete. 
this will raise runtime exception now. The compiler will allow you to be execute the program, but now we will receive a runtime exception because we didn't implement a clonable interface. We just provide the clone implementation, and this is just as simple as any other clone method, but we have to tell the compiler that we implement a clonable interface. Now, we revise our implementation. We have class A implement a clonable interface, and we have the constructors, and we provide the implementation for the clone. Again, we rely on super.clone to copy and retain an a copy of the objects. So you can see here, we have to specify that we are implementing the clonable interface. We provide the implementation for the clone. Now we have the demo. Do you think now we will be able to execute the program or still we miss something? Yes. We need the, the, the user to be able to use it. This is succeed. This is a complete implementation for a clone method. We specify in the header of the class that this class is going to implement a clonable interface. And then inside the body of the class, we provide the implementation for the clone. And we can use object one dot clone and retain an object to the client and then we cast this object to the type A character, which is the type of the class. Okay. Hint, if you, uh, you can here, for example, on the clone header, you can change the object. You can see here, we put public. You can change here the object type and put a capital. So you, do, you avoid doing the casting on the client side. So you just retain an object of type a capital on the header of your method. Any question? Yeah, all what the lectures from lecture zero up today is included on the laptops. Okay, so uh, I will use the. I'm not going to start a new topics. It's it's easy even. But uh, let me now uh, jump to maybe we spend some time discussing lab test uh, zero. So uh, the result for the lab test zero is in the mural. You can access by using ECS uh, uh, account. The result is good, but there is a, uh, some um, mistakes. One of the common mistakes is uh, the compilation. In the lab test one, I want you to make sure that the code you submit is combined. Otherwise, you will uh, receiving a very low grade. So, submitting uncompiled code is a really a serious problem because you are at the level of writing a Java program, okay, that this program is not compiled, is not acceptable, okay, at this level of this course. So, yes, might be your code is not fully functional, but at least it should be compiled, okay. So, in the lab test, one on Monday, make sure the code is compiled successfully without any compiler error before you submit. Otherwise, you, you will receive very low grade. Okay? Now, on the lab test one, we will provide you with an ABI called average of ABI. And you can see here. If I don't want to implement this method, or I don't have time to implement this method, the header of this method is already given on the ABI. So I can write the header on the, in the code, okay? And I can just retain zero. 
without providing anybody inside this method, okay? Just return zero. So at least my code, when I send it to compilation, it will compile successfully because this method is there and it's retained zero. So the header of the method is on the ABI. It's nothing hidden. So you can just copy the header, put it in your code, and you retain double. Any double number, you retain it. I don't need, I don't have time to implement this. Uh, there's 1.5. Marks, I don't need them. I, I focus on some other questions that four grades, for example, or four marks. So it's your decisions. And as you can see in the ABI, we provide a description of the method and some examples. And this example is supposed to help you to understand the, the behavior of this method and what you should write inside the implementations. And as you can see, we have only the parameters and retain type. We don't have like uh, uh, conditions, preconditions, exceptions. You will see this on the lab test one. You will see this on the lab test one. So this is the header of the method is given to you. If I didn't, uh, let's say I assume I don't have time to do this. What is the best choice for me? Just write retain zero. That's all. Semicolon. Okay, don't forget the semicolon. It should be written on the ABI. It should be written on the ABI. That is going to throw an exception if there is any violation of the precondition. No, if it's not written, you don't need to uh, come up with an, uh, throwing an exception if it's not written on the ABI. So we define sum is equal to zero, we start for loop through the uh, element of the array. Uh, there is some code is not compiled because it's saying there is an exception, runtime exception, okay, and we cannot be able to run this code, okay, we're not able to compile this code. It's good to know how you can visit this array. This is a prerequisite for this course. Just an array, once you define the array, you'll have attribute called link, and this will contain the number of elements inside the array. If you have an array of five elements, so length will contain five. The index of these five elements start from zero. Zero, one, two, three, four. There's no index for five. If you try to access index five, if there is an exception will be wait for you, okay? Now, we add all the elements to the sum, whatever is the length of the input array we receive, we're going to go over all the elements and we add them, and then we retain the average after. Okay? Some of you have a different version of this method, is simply by looking to the even or looking to the odd, but this is the common one was given to all the students. We didn't complete, we have to retain the average at the end. And once the header is specifying that we have to retain something, we have to retain it. The compiler will not allow us to compile your code if we don't have a retain statement. Now, all multiple of five is again, is another method. We have to check all the elements inside this array and make sure that the element is multiple of five. What do you mean by multiple of five? That's divisible by five. We divide it by five and you receive a remainder is equal to zero. So the mod operation give you zero, okay? Mod operation give you zero. So as you can see here, some elements are like two, is not divisible by five, which means they are not multiple of five. We have to retain false. And these, all the elements are multiple of five, we retain true. So we define Boolean as a result is equal to true. And look at the for loop. Inside the for loop, I'm checking the result. And I'm going to stop the for loop once I have a result as false. So uh, I initialize i is equal to 0. Result and i is less than the length. Whenever I, inside the body of for loop, I assign the result to be equal to what? The result. Whenever the result is true, I keep for loop inside the for loop. So at the end, I will retain result. 
So, if the result is very late, that means I found only one element is sufficient and enough to say that all the element is not multiple of five, I will retain immediately from this method. Reverse of, you have an array and you have to retain an array. And this is mainly, most of you are not able to retain a correct type. Okay? You have to retain an array. You, you're not retaining a, a value. You retain an array. Okay? You retain a reference to an array element. So you take an array, you revise this array, and you retain it. So one of the main thing here, if you receive an array of three elements, you have to retain an array of three elements. Okay? If you receive an array of ten elements, you have to retain an array of ten elements, not array with three elements. Okay? That is violation for this method. So, again, you know that array is fixed. You have to define at the beginning of your program how many space you need for this array, how many spaces. Whenever I receive input array, I take the length of input array and I specify, for example, I receive an array of five elements, I need to create an array of integer of five elements. I fix that. Because array is fixed, it's not expandable. You cannot change the size of array. You can change the size by destroying the current one and build a new one with a new size. Not the same as list array or array list where it's expandable and shrink. You can expand it and shrink it as long as you are running the program. Array, int, array, reverse, with new int, we define the length of the array. Now, it's very simple for loop. You Go over all the elements. The first element, you put it to the last element, and you continue doing all this for loop, and you retain the reverse at the end. So these are the three questions. Most of you have the same thing. Some of you have two array are reverse, check true or false. OK? It's the same concept. Now, these are the test units. I want you to look at these test units. These are some test units we provided to grade your submissions. So you can see here, I design a test JUnit test. The same thing will be on the test one. I will design a JUnit test, and I will provide it to you in the lab test. Even in the lab test, you, while you are working to solve the questions, you will be able to run and see if you are successfully implement this or not. Okay? So this average test one is av for average of I define an array, I write the expected average, then I call the average and see if the expected value is the same as the value that I'm looking for with some delta. Same thing, three and five. The second test the third test, fourth test, fifth test. And this is what is the beauty of the JUnit test we discussed. Testing is strategy. I can change the type of JUnit test. And I'm targeting only one method, one functionality in your code. I'm targeting average of. Now, it's, I design this JUnit so I can guarantee if you pass this, you receive 1.5 grade. If you didn't pass them, most likely you will have a broken implementation. Where is exactly that broken implementation? I don't know. I have to look at your code and see. And if the broken implementation is very serious and back to the root of this Java programming, for example, you're not able to do the for loop, you receive zero. Because it's not acceptable at this level of the course, you're not able to do the for loop to check all the elements inside that array. Yes? Do you agree? So if the broken implementation was because a small thing, you might receive 1 or you might receive 0.5. OK? So make sure these basic materials, you have them before, OK? Because that is what is the prerequisite means. You have this. You know how to do for loop. You know how to do if statements. You know that if you 
the header is specifying you have to retain an array. You have to retain an array. Otherwise, the compiler will not compile the code. Okay? So this design for the JUnit, and that is what is the JUnit is built for. Is I target one method, it's called average of, and I send different test scenarios and make sure that your implementation is complete. Then, okay, I received this, actually it's supposed not to show up, but anyway, I didn't uh, do this. You see this implementation? That's what I don't need you to do. Um, in the test zero, we provide you with the main test class, where inside the main test class, we send some scenarios, okay? And we ask you to do this and if there is a, this one of your implementation, some students, okay? Implementation for the average. What do you think about this? Did this method really calculate the average? Do we are trying to calculate the average of the array? What is he trying to do then? If th this method is not trying to, ca but look, five tests, he passed three. <laughs> do you think why he's passing three? Because he's trying to see the test and try to retain the value. He, he, he saw, look, he saw this one. Oh, if the array is two, I will retain 4.5. That is not the way of doing this. That is not the purpose of JUnit test. JUnit test is to help you, not to, to try to take the JUnit and do that sometimes. Oh, but look at him. Once ever i is equal to 2, he retained 4.5 immediately. You're laughing, but not only he, this only one student. We have more than 100 students in this class, and you can imagine randomly how much will be the number of students who did the same thing, okay? So, he look at the i, when i is equal to three, he look at this one. When i is equal to three, one, two, three, he will retain one. And he did the same thing. And look at the, the, the way, he's passing how many tests? One, two, three and he is failing the other. Then I start wondering, what is doing this guy? Because I have this, uh, I can look at this, and what, why he is able to succeed on these tests, why he is not able, then I was totally surprised when I look at this. Okay? So I don't want you to do the same mistake, please, on the test one. Okay? Because this is not acceptable. Not acceptable at all. Okay, the JUnit test, we provide, we can send the lab test one without JUnit test. We hide it. But that is not the one that we, are li we would like to do. We give you the JUnit test and we ask you to implement. So while you are doing the lab, there is an 18 minutes of the lab during the lab. You have to work on the problem, programming a problem. You have to complete the programming problem. And also while you are working with the program, you can test the functionality. And we designed the JUnit test to target methods inside your implementation so you can ensure that, oh, I implement the constructor correctly, I implement this correctly, and I implement this method correctly. And also, in the lab test one, we will have a small part for the written question. There is a multiple choice. You have to put the answer also on the clips file. There is a file on the clips. You have to put the answer on the clips file, and you submit that with your code. You have to submit the Java file. You don't need to submit the JUnit test. You submit the Java file uh, that contains your implementation. You submit also the answer for the written part with your submissions. I don't need the JUnit test to be submitted. Two questions. Two questions. One, 